So welcome everybody. I just want to say thank you to Kathy Alexander, who's going to be our speaker today, GPCE seminar series. She has, I think, just returned from Botswana, right? Is that what you said? Yeah. So tell us about her epidemiology work there. Kathy, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much for letting me join you. I took a little liberty and changed my talk a little bit just in thinking about what's happening and and what we're dealing with and all the unknowns that seem to keep popping up. And I thought it might be an important time to talk about the ecology of scale and understanding the disease emergence process. And here I'm going to talk about Africa. And I think this picture is from Kasani from where I work. And this is the grocery store. So you can see that we have a lot of interesting opportunities to evaluate the way in which landscape change and different types of contact networks and, and the like can influence disease transmission. Here, I've been working in Africa for 30 years. I know you're like, oh my God, she looks so young, how'd that happen? Just kidding, I know that's probably not being said. And there's no rejoinder of laughter, so I'll refrain from making jokes. But the grassroots uh, NGO that I run is called Caracol. I started it with Mark Bonavala, and he is there with me. I, he may or may not be online, but been a really important player, obviously, in all the research I'm going to talk about, as well as other collaborators, students, postdocs and the Caracol staff, which I'll recognize at the end of the talk. But the NGO is situated right next to the National Park. It's 17 hectares of land. It's where we're developing the Chobe Research Institute. And we have BSL-2 infrastructure and microbiology PCR capability. And we work cooperatively with the Botswana government under an MOU with the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Environment, and as well as the Office of the President. Our work is across the different missions of education where we have a school program at every single school in the district. So that's 12 schools. And when COVID wasn't operational, we were teaching a thousand kids a week. Community outreach in terms of everything from working with groups of support for sex workers and poverty alleviation schemes, such as a single head of household females trying to develop some economic opportunities to just working at youth employment and youth training programs. Our assistance to government is um, broad. I provide all the wildlife veterinary services and, for example, the mortality event that happened with the elephants to working as an advisor, a scientific advisor now on the Botswana Presidential COVID Task Force. And then, of course, our research portfolio, which is blended with those activities. This is an old picture of the facility, but we have been building on that and we will be building a new veterinary clinic. We're now going to build a Virginia Tech Center of Excellence there. And we do, as I said, have BSL2 capability, see a lot of students as well as providing veterinary services to the country. This is my disclaimer for two things. One, because I just got out of COVID, if anything sounds a little pinky and you're like, I didn't understand, are you gonna be like, oh, she has brain damage from COVID, we're fine with that. And I, by the way, I want to say I've spent all this time in Africa and I got COVID after five days being in the United States. So I think that is a great signature of what's happening in the country. Secondly, I'm not in a position right yet to provide any overview of the Botswana situation. We're busy working on that. Actually, interestingly, the president is pushing for scientific publications. So we hope to have an analysis out. We don't have the numbers, but I think the interesting issue is that we don't have the numbers. And our approach in COVID was to be preemptive. And just shortly, we closed everything down before we had cases. And, and there was only four of us, and it was a great team. And then the president brought in every single minister. And so we have every minister of every component of government and the task force, which is the four of us, and additional uh, people have been added now. But it's been a, a really, I've been very impressed with President Masisi's leadership. We've only had two deaths and have over a thousand cases. So we're doing very well in that respect and hopefully come back and share more with you. But going back to the over issue of scale and, and health and, and the, the sorts of challenges that face us in this respect, Africa is always viewed as this wonderful oasis of wildlife and, and picturesque natural landscapes. But the reality is quite different. People struggle quite substantially to have access to food. And this was and political stability and the like and HIV and all the other threats that, and, and impacts that have been imposed on people in Africa. Uh, and now, of course, with COVID, it's even worse. So we can still ask, and more importantly, how do we prevent disease and improve public animal and ecosystem health? So I thought there was some really interesting work here by Cohen and company, which just, I, I was fascinated by the work, and it got me thinking about 
how we need to reframe a lot of what we do. What they did is they looked at, at three different important pathogen groups and they asked the question at, you know, what spatial scale were these predictors statistically significant? And the black dots in these circles indicate where that predictor actually became significant in chytrid fungus, West Nile virus, and Lyme's disease. And you can see that at different spatial scales, that predictor had no relevance. And that meant that, that there was a lot of importance in determining what scale to operate. Now, this example is looking at spatial, but I think that spatial obviously is a, is a you know, from host, from microbial levels to landscapes or temporal, from millennia to yesterday. And where and what should we be looking at? And what was important here is that there was no single scale that would have detected the importance of these three predictors population density as a proxy for anthropogenic change, environmental factors, and host richness. And so that to me was really interesting and profound. And, and I, I think that it's important to recognize that factors become important at the scale in which they differ. So we won't see those factors if we don't have the correct scale. So the question is, what are we missing? And I think that becomes very important with regards to COVID because there just seems to be so many unknowns. We don't seem to Everything keeps surprising us, and I think it will keep surprising us. And, and scale may not be the issue, but certainly the issue of scale in terms of interacting factors and the issue of what are we missing when we fail to include something. So I thought today what I would do is, is really unpack this in terms of our study site, because this is something that fascinates me. So how far do we need to unravel this ball of string before we have enough information? And I haven't gotten to the bottom of my string, and I'm sure all of you would agree with me that there just ends up being so many factors that are important, and it gets very messy. And there used to be a time where I know people hated me talking because there were just too many things, and they didn't like it, and it was, had to be clean and tidy, and, and how do we, you know, just too much to grapple with. But really, it's the complexity, which is the key to all of this, which is why I've loved working with uh, Chris's group and Madhav and, and Stephen and Brian, because they love it as well. And, and I think it's been a really good mix. And I'm so excited to be a part of this current grant for that reason. So I'm going to look at my study site in Botswana. I'm going to take two of our research programs and we have more and all of it is certainly not included in, in this presentation, but I've just tried to pick a few things. For example, Jeff Shaman has done some really amazing modeling with us and, and so is Brian and different types and we're not including that here. One, because I feel like modelers like to present to modelers and I wouldn't want to disappoint um, those sorts of interactions and I think maybe if there's interest those presentations can happen at a later stage. Then we'll talk about diarrhea and tuberculosis in, in the context of scale and here I'm talking about factors that may or may not influence and not necessarily a spatial scale. So diarrheal disease and antimicrobial resistance, there's no doubt that diarrheal disease is a globally important problem. Nearly half of all child diarrheal deaths occur in Africa, so it's critically important to Africa, especially so in Botswana. In 2006, we had over 470 children die of diarrheal disease, so its significance is obviously critical. So I wanted to start digging into understanding what drives diarrheal disease and had through much climbing around in closets and various other scary activities, managed to pull together, I think, one of the longest national data sets in Africa, certainly, from 1974 to 2003. It's actually updated to present, so we have it running now up to 2020. But this paper was limited uh, to this data set. And you can see there's very clear environmental signature. There's um, it would appear to be environmental signature. The green there is the wet season, and the green lines mark the wet seasons for each year. But if we look at now trying to model this and we see what's important in the dry season and the wet season is different. Minimum temperature and minimum temperature divided by vapor pressure, so hot dry conditions are important in driving dry seasonal diarrhea. And in the wet season, we see that rainfall and vapor pressure are important. And what's even more interesting here is that contrary to what we thought, I think the dogma has always been diarrhea is a wet, you know, a rainfall problem. It, it isn't in Botswana. Now remember, Botswana is a dry land country. There's only three, and it makes a wonderful place to do research in terms of extracting environmental variables. There's only three sources of surface water in Botswana. And so those are minimal in terms of their influence on the dynamics at a national level in this dry land ecosystem. And the dry season is the highest point for diarrheal disease, not the wet season. 
And so the question is why, why would it be the dry season? And I couldn't make, and this is actually the October is the worst and it's called suicide month because it's just so awful with the temperatures over, you know, up to 115 degrees and it's very dry. Well, as it turns out, and, and I wouldn't have even thought about this if I, had I not gone and sat in the hospital and chatted with all the nurses to say, you know what, why? Why would it be the dry season? And the ladies were like, well, of, of course, yeah, the matron was like, you know, Dr. Alexander, of course, it's it's flies. And I was like, of course it is. Yeah, I should actually have you do my research because clearly you have a better understanding of the system. And actually, that is a recurrent theme throughout my work is that it seems like, you know, when you talk to people who actually own and know the problem, no matter how much research you do, they're really the ones that can give you the key insights. So getting into your field and talking to people is really critical to understanding system dynamics. And indeed, what we found, and when I started digging into it, we started a whole new research program on that, and I think I touch on it later, is that hot, dry conditions are the drivers of fly reproduction and density. And so fly dynamics, uh, and, and our data, uh, we've started a cohort study actually, seems to support that, that it is a fly issue. And indeed, we had the highest outbreak in 1992, which was the biggest uh, drought year that we've had in history. So then we can ask in this system, well, what does surface water do? Does surface water have a role? Is it different in those environments where water is extracted from surface water? And indeed, what we found is, yes, it's significantly different. And I'm going to talk about that through a series of slides. This on the right-hand side is a just several years of data just to show you how the system works. And we see a peak in the rainfall. And as we start seeing the floodwaters rise, and as the floodwaters rise, we don't have very much diarrhea. So diarrhea is not associated with flood per se. It is, however, associated with drainage of the system. As the floodwaters recede, that's when we have the biggest diarrheal outbreaks. So we have a biannual pattern of diarrheal disease occurrence. And this is work I did with Jeff and and Alex and and some um, and and they've taken it forward again with some really beautiful modeling of this system. But what we see, in short, is that the timing of these biennial outbreaks are different. Surface water is critical, and indeed, one meter drop in floodwaters translated to a 16.7 increase in diarrheal disease with the lag period. And the season differed in the persons that were affected. So dry season, we had more five years and older affected and the dry season is the adults that were affected. And there was no difference for children under one years of age. So there's a lot to talk about with that, but I won't. Uh, wet season, even the clinical profile of diarrheal disease changed, likely because of the environmental influences on the types of waterborne pathogens that individuals are exposed to. One issue I wanted to mention is that in this instance, if we try to predict climate change impacts on Botswana, in particular in northern Botswana, we would have it wrong because people use national climate data to predict national climate impacts. However, the flood dynamics are dictated by the rainfall patterns in the highlands of Angola. So you have these interesting teleconnections. We've also identified ENSO relationships to diarrheal disease, again with Jeff. And so there's some really important interactions, but they're external to the country, which I think underscores the importance of making sure that the scale of your environmental assessment and determining climate change impacts is correct. So moving forward then, what about the surface water? What do we know about it? Well, do wildlife densities and how do they influence? So wildlife use of the landscape, do we see any impacts? And just in case you were bored with me, I put in some nice little videos. Then, you know, in, in this instance, what we're seeing in these landscapes down below, we see some spatial models of, these are SAR models, and we can see the graphic representation of where we have hotspots, and they differ for total suspended solids, for coliforms, and for E. coli. And what we found is that where we have these hotspots in the national park, which is to the left here, so this the red area represents the town, the blue represents mixed, and to the left is the National Park, which allows us again to ask interesting questions about land use. We have hotspots where we have the big areas where animals come down and drink. And this has something then to say about land use. As we constrain wildlife to protected areas, we can influence ecosystem services. And this becomes a really important critical political message. I can tell this to parliamentarians and they can say the reason we need to maintain the national park is not just because we want to save animals, but because we want to make sure you get clean water. And by compressing, using, and degrading floodplain regions, we see a consequent decline in those ecosystem services. And when we started then saying, 
well, who ends up in the hospital? Is there anything we can understand from just who's in the hospital? And there's a limitation to that, right? I mean, we're not asking who's not in the hospital. But if we ask who's actually in the hospital with diarrheal disease, we saw that kids and adults were separating, just like we saw that the occurrence of diarrheal disease and who it affected also had a temporal dynamic. And when we started asking the question about who is going to be in the hospital, and we found that they're, the most important predictor for adults was diarrhea in the household. So I interpreted this again to be the idea that people don't wash their hands and so on and so forth. But our data is showing something very different. We had 30 households that we sampled for two years every week. And I can tell you that was a real treat to have to go and look at all these pit trains and sample flies and walk around them. But what became very apparent is that little kids don't have access to pit latrines. It's a paper I'm going to write right now because despite being a millennium development intervention, children under seven or eight don't use them. So what do they use if there's no parent around to help them? They defecate around the pit latrine. What happens if you have diarrheal disease and you already have a fly problem and you're defecating around the pit latrine as a child, you are going to probably spread it to adults in the household. So while hand washing may have an influence, it may also be that behavioral limitations on accessing sanitation influences exposures. And that's where we're seeing that transmission occur. What about other health behaviors that can influence diarrheal disease transmission and environmental mechanisms of exposure. And what we found here is that people had a lot of um, household water that they couldn't get rid of. This was a household survey I did, I'm only showing you a little bit of it. And what I asked to do was use everybody's pit latrine. It was 120 households. And that again was another treat. I did a TEDx talk on that, it was so fabulous. And I found that there was a lot of pit latrines that were full of water, couldn't figure out what that was about. So I sat down with the households and I said, what is all this water? And they said, well, what happens is they've been told by the district health teams, do not throw the water into the yard because your house is too close and you're attracting flies and contaminating, et cetera. Throw it away. But they don't have anywhere to throw it away. So they're throwing all the household water from baths and dishwashing and everything down the pit latrine. What do you do when you do that? You turn the pit latrine into a septic tank without the benefit of fermentation and all the exclosure components of a septic tank. And you then have this hydrologic overloading that leaches fecal waste, and this is on rock, so it goes right into surface water. And indeed, we're seeing a haze of MDR, which I'm coming to on, on a different matter, but uh, we see MDR haze in front of where all this low-income housing is located. Moving then to microbial resistance, how might those same sorts of factors influence uh, this kind of process? Well, where, I mean, the biggest question really is, despite the fact that we talk about it all the time, and this is why Chobi is such a great place to work, we don't have agricultural production systems, commercial. We have no commercial agriculture with the ex exception of now presently one agricultural field where they grow corn. So what can we ask then about antimicrobial resistance that is widespread in this system, multi-drug resistance that is widespread? And how can we, with the alleviation and removal of agriculture, start asking questions about how does antibiotic resistance occur in these systems without that overshadow of agriculture? And can we use life history strategies? This is what struck me as really cool. Africa has so many different animals that do so many different things. And so if they have different types of connections with the landscape, can we use those to start isolating exposure pathways? And I believe we can. I think this can also work really well in the United States and other places. So again, MDR is widespread, but it's not ubiquitous. So this differential type of environment allows us to ask questions about what connections are important, what behaviors or exposure platforms. And what we found is that synanthropic species, which isn't terribly surprising, animals that live with humans are positive and that animals that feed at the top of the food chain have a lot of MDR and animals that are water associated have high levels. What's interesting is what who doesn't have Cattle did not have high levels of MDR. So living with humans was not enough. I think I'm, I'm, we're looking at goats now, but I suspect goats that eat human rubbish that are in the garbage and, and messing with all that will have the same level as mongoose and warthogs and baboons and those sorts of species. And what about water associated? Well, if you're not water associated, for example, animals that drink water, but that don't live in the water, like Impala, had very low levels of antibiotic resistance. So drinking water wasn't enough. You had to live in it. And I'm not sure, is that because you're ingesting a lot of sediments? Is it just a concentrated exposure? So elephants and water uh, and hippo, water buck, 
things that we know are in water. So water is clearly an important medium for transmission in the system. And so if we look at water in relation to human and wildlife in terms of water and non-water associated, we can see that humans obviously dominate the profile here. And we can see then that there's a similar pattern in water and water associated and less so in non-water associated. So I think what we're seeing here, water is important. The question that we're asking right now, because we've been, we had six weeks of lockdown, we have no people in the national park, we are asking the question, what happens now if we remove humans from this system? And is it the case that we see antimicrobial resistance leave the system? Or is it the fact that the human imprint is maintained irrespective of the removal of the human inputs as an acute process? And I hope to have the data seen on that and hopefully be able to share it with this group at some time in the future. But what about the spatial patterns of, of this? And I'm just going to give you another break with a video. Our water quality, we've been looking at water quality dynamics in this system just to, to provide a little background of some of the data you've been looking at since 2010. Every two weeks, we sample the water, and we have it across land use. And so we have urban, town, and mixed. And what we're seeing when we look at multi-drug resistance in E. coli isolates we're seeing that there's a very different temporal pattern that differs by space. And one of the issues is that in the national park, we have a lot of floodplains. And these floodplains have that process of larger concentration of inundation and retraction into the central canal. And so we see that land form itself is very important. And the time in which flood and hydrological shifts occur is important, not only in terms of determining water quality and diarrheal disease, but also in multi-drug resistance. And if, if this is just another um, a graphic representation where we did Krigging, sorry, that was the previous example as well, where we looked at mean MDR. And what we found as well that we had differences by dry and wet season across land use and that there is some important end season and that we have uh, culverts and water entrance points may be important in the urban environment, which is not surprising that water culverts might change the spatial pattern of MDR. But this area here and this area here also confounded by the fact that we have low income housing here and dominantly pit latrine waste removal system. Then is this a culvert process or is this a pit latrine or a combination of both? And we're looking at trying to refine our understanding. Oh, and I should go back and show you that the water intake here for the entire district, which makes the whole data analysis very rich. So that enti the entire district, all eight communities have and utilize water that is drawn from two points. And the, the first point and the primary point for the study that I'm showing you now is just as the water traverses the national park. At the end of the day, why is all this happening? Why is diarrheal disease end up being a problem in Africa, despite the fact that, and I must note that most papers don't note or don't identify the fact that it's not as if these countries don't have water infrastructure. Most of them do. So why does the water infrastructure not work? It's not just as though people are going down to the river and drinking. And in case, some cases they do, but in a lot of cases they're not. In urban centers, they're not. In Botswana, they're not. They're not using water from the river. They're using water from the tap, and yet we have diarrheal disease that is linked to environmental conditions. And what I think is happening is this. So just an overview, we have the rainfall events, we get overflow from the land pushing fecal material in, and then we have uh, increasing E. coli and decreasing TSS, which, and if you remember, or I'm not sure if you do, that, that sediments increase the longevity of bacteria. So the more sediments you have, the, the bacteria grab onto it and the sediment type is important as well. So if you have clay soils versus sandy soils, that will increase the attachment and the survival of bacteria. This becomes important in water infrastructure. So we have overland movement of terrestrial microbial populations into surface water, which then we see a concomitant in diarrheal disease outbreak. In the dry season, we have this flood that comes from the Angolan highlands. The water rate, uh, by the time the rainfall gets to Botswana, it's in the Botswana dry season. And we see this inundation of all the floodplains that previously had fecal matter and suspension of those microbial communities and, and other nutrients in those land types, the floodplain particularly. But in the dry season, now we see this removal back into the channel and a concentration where we see increasing TSS and increasing E. coli, but TSS is really the, the, in, the, the real trigger here because 
it actually increases then the survival. And what it does more importantly, in terms of water infrastructure is that you have to, water infrastructure is based dominantly on chlorine, but other types of disinfectants that need sediments removed to be effective. So if you have sediments there, your disinfection processes don't work. And when your sediment levels are bouncing all over the place, your flocculants, those chemicals that you put in to draw the sediments out so you can then clean the water, don't work. And you then have sediment in the water that retain bacteria. And then the data suggests that this is where we see the diarrheal disease. So we go back to asking the question about the piece of string. In my mind, there's many, many, many variables. And to get stuck on one thing wouldn't be adequate. If we just got focused on we need to have things, it wouldn't be enough. All of these elements to really understand the system and, and manage it. And as I've noted, we need even more information than what I've sent you here. And, and we do have it, but there are so many pieces to the puzzle that stopping or getting focused on one thing, although easy, tidy, useful, and you can accomplish, it's not probably going to give you the answers on how you're going to manage the system and the problem. And what about tuberculosis in Botswana? And here I'm going to use an example of M. mungai. M. mungai is a novel mycobacteria that I discovered actually in my children's sand pit when I worked. Uh, mongoose were infected in my children's sand pit in the national park when I was the wildlife veterinarian for the government. And so I wasn't any sort of sleuthing on my part. But what was challenging is to figure out how it's transmitted. Here's just a profile of where it fits in. And you'll see that M. mungai is here in this clade with Dasi bacillus and M. suricata and that a chimpanzee isolate. There's only one from West Africa. And then M. africanum lineage two, which is supposed to, is a human tuberculosis strain, but is thought to be an animal adapted strain. And, and this would suggest that it is. It's, it's separating out. And we only see people from West Africa with this particular lineage, and M. mungai is very closely related to M. africanum. It is also important to note that this M. mungai organism is really very different, and it was a super challenge for me, and a point of uh, absolute depression at some times, because it was just, it, you can't grow it, like, it's like leprosy, you can't, you can't grow this organism. It is impossible, no matter what we've done after 20 years, we've not been able to grow it, which meant we couldn't sequence it. We finally managed to do that. And it took forever to figure out how it's transmitted. It is not like everything else. Uh, and I'll back up to say what you already know is TV is a global threat, et cetera. And that the primary transmission route, as you know, is generally oral or there is some gastric with uh, in humans uh, exposures. And maybe in some animals, uh, lions may, of course, have some oral exposures, it, they think in Kruger, for example, to MTV. But in banded mongoose, it's not respiratory. In fact, respiratory disease is only in late stage and only in a minority of cases. So how in the world does this thing get transmitted? Here's a species that lives in a den. Every night, all cuddled up into a ball, sleeps at lunchtime, all cuddled up into a ball. Certainly a respiratory pathogen would be much more successful at respiratory transmission in a host given the close contact, but that's not the case. It's a novel route. And I would like to say that I did not figure out this because I was really clever. I just ran out of orifices and secretions to figure out how this is transmitted. And I did, I just ran out of, the last thing there was to look at was anal gland secretions. And indeed that's where it's transmitted. How it works is banded mongoose as a lot of mammals rely on olfactory communication, critical component of their social behavior and social cohesion and, and then between group cohesion and communication. And a lot of animals, a lot of carnivores rely on this. And so it hijacks olfactory communication networks and it moves within groups and between groups through those secretions. So animals mark each other and investigate. And that's the cool thing about this. You create a mark into the environment, an environmental source of pathogen, but it's no longer sort of a random deposition like you might have with anthrax. This is a directed deposition. In my secretion, which protects you with the lipids, and M. mungai is hydrophobic, so it loves that, I now have to put a message. So you need to go and smell that message. It's not just a random interaction with the environment. It's a specific directed effort for transmission through olfactory communication and it goes through their nose and through injuries in the skin and through the lymphatics and blood system and then it invades the mongoose host and in some cases pulmonary disease and the end stage. So how does, I mean this is a really interesting thing, how does host social structure then influence disease transmission risk? And 
here's an interesting issue in terms of the Ali effect, and most of you will be aware of it, but the Ali effect is the idea that aggregation has evolutionary benefits to you as a, a group living species in terms of vigilance and food acquisition. And so you aggregate to increase survival of your group. But obviously, when it comes to infectious disease, there's a, a similar negative consequence as aggregation increases transmission of pathogens. And so you may, if, and this is what we see in banded mongoose, that in a lot of species, you see that you don't have, you know, you had 100 animals and 50 and 60 and whatever. You have 15, 10, and 6, and then you don't have a group anymore. And this is what we're seeing with uh, Lee effects in social species that infectious disease can be very important in terms of predicting when a species might enter a group extinction event and disappear from the landscape. And indeed, looking at this, we can see that if we look at sociality along a continuum of carnivores and we start asking across a number of species, what is important and do we see group Lee effects? Yes, obviously you see them with highly social species. You do not see them with solitary. Do we see ex high extinction rates in highly social species? Yes, we do. And of those extinction rates, 45% are infectious disease that threaten that, in that species persistence. Whereas in solitary, it's very low. Only 3% of species actually have infectious disease as an issue threatening their survival. So here we can see that it's very important. Sociality has a very important influence on predicting infectious disease impacts but we can also ask then, what are the implications to pathogen evolution? If you look at this situation and you start thinking about animals that randomly mix and there's no social structure, you may have certain individuals that are affected. They may or may not transmit to other individuals. And it's really just a wave sort of process across the landscape influenced and, and by that, a diffusion type of thing influenced by environmental circumstance. However, if you start adding the social structuring component that to this, we have a very different scenario. Now, an individual has to disperse and be accepted into that group for transmission of directly transmitted pathogens to occur. And there may or may not be a transmission at boundary interactions, uh, depending on the nature of the pathogen. However, if you have an environmental deposition of the pathogen, here, now I don't have to have contact with you as a group or disperse to your group or have physical contact with tuberculosis would be very difficult for transmission, right? We need sustained contact for tuberculosis transmission. Now I can go and smell a mark from your group that may or may not be infected. This may infect me and then I move it to my group. Let's go back to the issue of dispersal though. We know that dispersal does occur and how does that influence the process and is there an influence of landscape on dispersal? So we tend to have a dispersal rate in most of our models. You know, we have a transmission rate in most of our models. And I think what our work is showing us is that maybe to have a really, and maybe under certain circumstances, these compartmental models, and this is something I'm working with Brian and Gabriella on is, and Madhav and that group is, is at what stage do you need an agent-based model? At what point do you really need to engage this variation? And when is it immaterial to the system? And I think that is an ongoing bit of work that we're still engaging. I'm sure Brian's really excited to share all that. So I'll leave that with him. But just going back to the individual factors that might influence transmission and we might engage in a modeling platform, we're seeing that gene flow is higher in urban landscapes and that individuals are not dispersing to their boundary troops. They're dispersing beyond those. And up above here is just the genetic structure of our mongoose populations broken into seven groups. This is how the analysis fell out from microsatellite studies done by my colleagues um, and my student uh, Kelton and colleague Hellerman. And what we see here is that you can see Chobe Game Lodge is way in the park here, but you can see dispersers are moving all the way through the landscape and not, not landing in certain troops, but going to other troops. So there's a lot of complexity. There's a land use influence on the level of, of dispersal, high levels of movement amongst urban troops that are more concentrated but long distance removal across troops amongst individuals. So trying to use dispersal as a mechanism of understanding where you would get pathogen, again, isn't gonna be a diffusion process. It's gonna be more complex than that. Well, what about dispersal at the individual level? Is it fair to characterize dispersal by land use or does it matter what's happened with you if you're diseased or you're injured? And yes, it looks like it's very important. We saw that 
diseased or injured mongooses were significantly less likely to disperse than healthy individuals. And clearly, this has a huge impact on estimating transmission. Additionally, we found that animals that were sick stopped scent marking at some point in their clinical disease. And I, I don't have a slide on that, but it's uh, worth noting because then we have to parameterize when an individual is going to shed and transmit. So moving into an infectious compartment may not be adequate because you may stop this particular behavior because of sickness or some other reason. And in this instance, it looks like you just get too sick and you're no longer interested in communicating. You are, you are groomed by individuals, but you no longer groom, you no longer scent mark, and you no longer engage your conspecifics. What about space use and how does human waste or all landscapes equal if you're in the urban environment or a park? Are they all, it's just urban or park or is there, are there components of those landscapes that are really important in predicting how you would conduct yourself? And here we have utilization distributions for an example, park and town troop. And we can see in the town troop, this big peak, this is a garbage dump right here. They're living in this spot and they do move across the landscape to this spot. We're gonna come back to it uh, on the right here, and this is another garbage dump at another lodge. So this is a lodge, moving here to another lodge, passing all these other troops, and here is a park on the left-hand side. This is the utilization distribution for a park trip, very large. But what we found more interestingly that in the dry season, we had a reversal of space use that most of these ecological theories predicted would be large and that we see that these, the urban landscapes are changing our theoretical models for how animals might move and occupy a landscape over time. But what about using the waste? Does that have an influence? Does it change behavior? Is that relevant to transmission? And yes, we found so. Here's another video. I've always liked to think this just kind of reminds me of my children. If my kids are listening, I apologize for saying that. I'm not sure if you can hear And you can see that these interactions are really quite intense. And indeed, troops that utilized garbage dumps had more TB disease likely because of their injuries. So in this instance, human waste has a direct effect, not the, the direct effect of just exposing, indi exposing individuals to pathogen, but changing behavior, which changes pathogen transmission as a consequence. And I think that's a really interesting outcome. But what about waste and landscape use in the microbiome? How can that influence disease transmission, homeostasis in the host, and how does the landscape vary and the host populations that occupy those landscapes, and what can we start to, to say about that? And this is some work that I did with a colleague of mine, Andrew, and, and um, he here's the, the river water microbiome, and you can see that it, when we start looking at the uh, structure here, it pulls away from national park to urban and mixed. And so we're seeing a separation in the river microbiome based on land type. But when we now look at mongoose, which is a great model system because these mongoose occur across all the land types, we can see a similar separation between urban and uh, we didn't include any mixed here. We have urban and urban lodge and national park lodge. So living at a lodge in the park is important, and it's different if you live in the national park or the urban area, and we're going to come back to that. Lodge environments are important, but they're different, and they differ from urban environments. But what can we say then, and, and this is some work being done by my, my graduate student, Nick Seibertz, on the microbiome, and he's actually developed a transcriptomic profiling for identifying and separating out mongoose that are sick. Of course, with TB, it's very difficult to tell if a mongoose is sick prior to the presentation of clinical signs. And this assay helps us differentiate them. One of the interesting things we're finding though is one of the, the targets, KLF2, was only found in pulmonary disease. And that's intriguing that maybe we're gonna find some other underlying mechanisms that translate into the occurrence or the question of why pulmonary disease only happens in some cases. It's a presentation on its own. So you either have a presentation where it's organs and nose or you have emaciation and you have organ and then pulmonary disease. And I think what we're gonna find is some interesting relationship to the, the issue of the lung gut axis. And I find this fascinating. I think I mentioned this earlier. I think this is gonna be very important or could be very important in COVID and how the gut microbiome 
plays an immunoregulatory role in lung function? And is it the case that these variations that we're seeing in the microbiome, could that explain in some part the, the presentation, the lung involvement in late stage disease? We know we have variation in the microbiome. We don't know at the individual level, and this is an area of investigation that we're pursuing now. Um, but what about eviction? And uh, if you throw an individual out and behavior, how does an animal interact with sick animals and how does that influence the outcome? So as I said before, less time active, not grooming, but there was no evidence of avoidance. They were not kicking these mongooses that were sick and unable to contribute out of the group. And that's an interesting question. Why wouldn't there? There are a number of species that show avoidance of disease conspecifics. Uh, banded mongoose do not have that. Why is that? Uh, what is the difference in sociality that eviction or non-eviction may become a consequence? And the, I think it may do with the, the fact that in these systems where they actually kick individuals out, these are voluntary fluid temporary groups. But in banded mongoose, they're obligate social animals, stable, permanent groups. So kicking an individual out may not be evolutionarily beneficial and, and, you, and you retain them. So what about landscape influences on denning behavior? Is that different? And why does that matter? That we know that the anthropogenic dens last longer. And in fact, we saw there was a relaxation of territoriality only in urban environments where they would actually share dens. And that they, these urban dens lasted longer, potentially with more pathogen. But what if we ask a question about bacteria? And I know you're probably all ready for a nap about now, but what about that? What happens when we start asking questions about other pathogens besides tuberculosis and mongoose behavior? And I'm just throwing this in just to show you that there's a lot of interesting issues here. Campylobacter jejuni, circling back to our diarrheal disease example, is a really important organism causing a diarrheal disease, probably one of the most important in children. And we see a wide variety of species involved in jejuni carriage and humans are infected at a high level. These are from samples. I've been getting samples from the hospital for the last 10 years or 15 years, fecal samples, respiratory samples, blood samples. And we're seeing in the fecal samples, high levels of jejuni infection. And similarly in banded mongoose. But what's interesting is jejuni carriage in banded mongoose was higher in anthropogenic densites. Whereas mongoose that lived in natural dens, there was higher overall levels of Campylobacter, but at the genus level. So it matters where you den. It somehow increases or perhaps human pathogens and their movement and activities may increase exposures in wildlife. And we might have circles. We see here, uh, we're finding it in marabou storks and banded mongoose in baboons, warthogs, elephants, hippos. The question is gonna be once we've removed humans from the landscape during the lockdown period, for example, how much of this disappears? And how much of the reinfection problem that we have with Campy is because we have these cycles of transmission. And this is a subject of a new NSF grant that we have looking at, at solid waste and scavengers and urban adapters and urban avoiders and humans. And, and hopefully at a later date, we'll come back and share some of those results. But what about the temporal scale in space use? So nobody looks at diurnal species and their space use, but I would argue they're very important. We found that 3% of our trap days, mongoose went and investigated other uh, dens and other, other groups of mongoose, something we would have never known had we not had those camera traps up. Um, this I, is really exciting to me, and I try to explain it. So when you start asking all of these questions and you start saying, okay, well, there's these other higher level things, behavior's important, landscape's important. What about the interaction between behavior and landscape? Is that change pathogen transmission? Is that another complexity that we need to think about? And what we found indeed, and this I have to go, uh, shout out for C.A. Nichols, my uh, student here who did a lot of amazing, she got an amazing number of papers out and, and looked at all of these photos and it just did some really good field work here as well, that we're seeing that these mongoose troops across the landscape, that the interaction between vigilance, that is, in the lower left here, this mongoose looking for either competitors or looking for predators. So vigilance is dual in its allocation. So it's an important, critically important behavior and it, it differs in when it's utilized. And we see that that difference in its application translates to its influence on olfactory communication behavior. So in lodge environments, there's a lot of competition for those waste resources and there's very few predators. 
vigilance is often associated with detecting competitors that are coming in to try to take the goodies. And then when you meet a competitor, you're scent marking, you're getting excited, and there's a lot of a, an escalation in olfactory communication. However, on the far right, where we see vigilance and olfactory, and we ask about that interaction, when you're vigilant here, generally you're looking for predators. And if you see a predator, you're running for your life and you're not engaging in olfactory communication. It's not adaptive. So we saw vigilance as a, a depressor of olfactory communication. And the same in urban environments where humans in urban environments outside of the lodge environment are actually predators. They hurt mongoose, they throw stones or uh, try to kill them. And so they're very alert to humans and they run. And it, what we also saw is that group size, the increased number of individuals decreased vigilance, the many eyes hypotheses. So what does this mean? It means that, that behavior landscape interactions have the potential to create super spreading environments or transmission hotspots, and that our modeling may need to counter or cater for differential transmission probabilities that are attached to these kinds of influences. So again, here we see a myriad of variables. I haven't included some, uh, 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 quite a few actually, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it, but the idea here was just to illustrate that complexity can be critically important and that single scale or single focus approaches are unlikely to provide the necessary insight into these issues of ecological complexity, but is the ecological complexity itself that I think provides the foundation for understanding system dynamics and more importantly, interventions that are appropriate and needed in those systems. I wanted to just recognize again all the many, many people that contribute to this. And I'm sorry, I, I meant I ran out of time uh, because of COVID and all the rest of it to update the NSF. We have two more NSF grants and obviously the expeditions grant here should be on there. And um, I wanted to thank everyone who's contributed, thank all the Caracol staff that work tirelessly to help, Mark and the crew, uh, Claire, Monica, Lennon, and the Botswana government. It's been cut off here, but we work cooperatively under MOU with Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Health, and the um, Office of the President. So thank you so much. And now we can turn it over for you to escape. <laughs> Great talk, Kathy. Wonderful. It was wonderful. Thanks. Um, thanks, Kathy. And you have a few minutes for questions. So uh, if anybody has a question, raise your hand or feel free to unmute or put it in the chat box and I can read it out. Oh, please unmute and just say something. Like, what was your name again? <laughs> Hi, this is Robin. And uh, Kathy, I have to say, that was probably one of the best talks I've heard in a very long time. Oh, That's thank you. Absolutely astounding. It's just incredible. And of course, you know, I know Botswana well. My wife is from there, so there's a nice. person there as well. But, but more than that, I think this is just, so it's just amazing, amazing work. We do work on antibiotic resistance in the environment, but mostly coming out of human waste. We haven't really looked at this uh, animal host interaction. And I think at some point we'd like to get you in front of the presidential council on antibiotic resistance, because this aspect of being able to use the lockdown to look at these interactions, which should have hopefully at least been interrupted is really important in uh, assessing attribution, which is always the big question, right? You always want to know attribution, and that's the impossible question to answer unless we have something bizarre. Like, anyway, I'll probably email you later. I've got a lot of ideas about you know things that I wonder if others have looked at and so forth because it's not a literature I pay attention to. But oh. uh, I should say my colleagues on this council basically half of them are from the animal side, but we don't really have a good thought process on wild animals, and I, I suspect this is not just a Botswana problem. It's probably there for New Jersey and deer populations or everyone's living around wildlife anyway. So I, I think there's a useful US. But thanks a lot for that talk. Oh, thank you. And I, I'm really excited. Please do reach out. And I'm sure there's a lot of opportunities. And thank you so much for the kind words. And um, I really appreciate that. Kathy, this is Madhavir. I like what Ramran says, just uh, amazing connections. Talk was complex as well, as much as the, the complexity that you were trying to convey. It's hard to imagine how they're all connected. We all keep saying it, but I think your talk showed it very well. I think there's so many modeling uh, things to consider once this COVID thing goes away, we can look to more interesting questions as well. But I had a few questions related to the AMR stuff that you were talking about. 
human fecal waste seems to be a huge player. But some of the routes you mentioned seem to be present in Indian systems too. So I'm, I'm really kind of surprised. I mean, we do see some of the, the resistance and Ramanan is an expert, so I let him speak. But at least intuitively, I see some routes being present, but the level maybe is not as high in India. I do not know what you and Ramanan think. I just very intrigued uh, by this. Well, I, I think one of the things that the, the study system allows, which is, um, which can be harnessed in this respect. We're seeing up really high levels of MDR, certainly not the same as the urban center, but up river of humans. And I, I've started coining this idea of bioconnectors, this idea that we start talking about teleconnections from a weather standpoint, Enzo and what have you, but bioconnectors where animals are moving across a landscape and, and contributing to these dynamics and the issue of wildlife or domestic animals or even fish. And one of the things we want to start is to understand how fish that will move up and down uh, hydrological systems might influence those dynamics. So I think it's not as easy as uh, human fecal waste. I think that the one big area of focus for us now is then trying to understand how solid waste influences those dynamics. And um, we've just got a paper that we should be getting out shortly, just going over the role of solid waste, which is really left out. And that's what we're focusing on now is how do scavengers, equally domestic dogs, utilizing solid waste uh, that is agricultural in orientation, distribute across the landscape. So we always think of agriculture sitting here dumping into a system and humans dumping into a system, yet the agricultural footprint is much larger and more complex. And I think that the connectors across the landscape are so. So that I think this, this is a really critical question that you've raised. The one thing I hope we'll be able to walk away with in a few months is, or maybe a little bit more because we've had a really high flood, so it complicates things a bit. But when you extract humans out of that landscape, and I mentioned this earlier, but I think it's worth reemphasizing, Will we see a reduction in antimicrobial resistance? Is that really it? Take humans out, problem gone, or it's gonna carry on because there's a fitness advantage to being resistant as a microbe. And so we're seeing evidence in our system that, that multi-drug resistance is something that is accumulated prior to diarrheal disease events in our E. coli isolates and it looks to be a fitness attribute. So E. coli rank, E. coli, I didn't include this data, but E. coli concentrations increase over here in relation to a diarrheal disease outbreak, but NDR to E. coli increased prior to all of that. So is the mechanism of driving pathogen presence in the system, as well as driving antimicrobial retention or spread, something that has got a distal factor that is influencing both? So I don't know, but I, I think your question is, it, will India be the same because there's so many people and so many different ways that they engage the landscape? I think we'll see flavors of the same thing um, and the degree to which cultural behaviors influence, you know, the way people just, uh, uh, we've talked about that. The, and I know Adil, I don't know if he's here, we've talked about how different groups of people have different waste removal systems, you know, digging a hole or burning it and how those different and the different environmental influences, rainfall and leaching types of issues. So how does all of that come to play? And I think all of them will be important, but like that first slide, the, the spatial scale or the, the way in which they interact will probably then translate into the profile you see. Oh, very cool. So there's a very nice New York Times article in the end here. Uh, we talked about downstream prevalence of certain kinds of uh, biome in the Indian rivers, especially the Ganges, and you could see a very clear change in the species as you went down. You know, up up north, water is relatively clean and pure, but as you go down, you see this. And people have done some very nice work. Ramanan would know more about it, but anyway, thanks. I'll let others speak and ask questions. I might just add quickly that we've developed a hydrological model for the system as well. And one of the things we're trying to do is seeing, can we actually integrate antimicrobial resistance as a constituent of hydrological models to ask about landform and flow and how those interactions, and, and this is with Adil Godridge and his students. So that's, a, I think, an exciting step for us. Great. I think we may have time for one more question. Stephen, would you like to chime in? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering how we're supposed to go about modeling these complex systems. You know, traditionally, people have tried to build up models 
adding in the most relevant factor and then the next most relevant. And it just doesn't seem like a good approach to addressing these issues that you've raised. Yeah, I, and I think that's a really powerful question and something that we need to, how do we, how do we engage complexity and still be able to contain the system? And what is important and what isn't important and when is it not important? And you know, all models, the wrong thing, of course, comes to bear. But I, I agree with you. I, I, I think there's a lot of really important thinking about when do you need an, an agent-based type of thing and when, when can you leave it as a just a, it doesn't really matter. These other things don't matter. They're nice, but they don't matter. And I, I think that is going to be such a case-by-case -case basis. So I think the big flag, of course, is when it's not, you're not really getting what you're seeing, then you know, you're not, you're not engaging all the complexity. The problem is that you could pick up the wrong things and get maybe the appropriate outcome. And the real, the real meat of the problem, the real point of control is not engaged. And then you don't see the capacity to, to mitigate. And that's the danger with trying to just decide what's important based on the outcome, because you may not then have what's important in terms of control. Okay, well, we're just a, a little bit past our stop time. So I just want to say thank you again to Kathy for an excellent talk and then for uh, sharing your research, uh, really interesting with us today. Just a reminder for our next seminar that will be uh, from Jeff Townsend uh, at Yale. That'll be in two weeks from today on September 10th. So I hope to see everybody again then. Thank you thank so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kathy, excellent, excellent talk. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much.